coconuts demon.
hey, I'm uh, getting to the point, which means I think the company is just slightly behind and I'm sort of even right on the side. Uh, if you look at this as a max, it's a few of these companies being on the right side of this, uh, who are doing this as well. And then here you can get at least 3,000 feet, maybe, but it's more like 3,000 feet in the middle of the And uh, just a few people who have a very nice tour. Back down to his instrument, giving absolute perfect. Okay, well, as you look at Peter at the top of that one now, you can't fail to miss Paul Barker in the uh, morning, that guy. And uh, Smokey's on, so very shortly now, get back off the room. And uh, Peter will give the stage to go. simple design proved popular in the developing world and versions were sold to air forces around the world. In the 1980s a handful of vampires were still in service in the 80s with the Zimbabwe and South African air forces and would you believe almost 3,300 were actually built, a quarter of them under license. Not surprisingly you will have heard of the Venom, well this was very much the lead in aircraft and that's why we refer to it very much as the benchmark. came out of uh, Christchurch itself in uh, 1952. It 
entered service with uh, 229 OCU in March 1953. Registered as Golf Victor Tango India India, it's actually Whiskey Zulu 507 from the Royal Air Force, which retired from service in 1969. In 1980, it became the first ex-military jet to be put onto the UK civilian register. Based at Northfield Airfield in Essex, it's believed to be the only British-built ex-RF Vampire T-11 flying in the world. What you're hearing there is the sound of the goblin, a major breakthrough producing uh... the F1 version of this. Uh... Flew 1946 and first joined 247 Squadron at Chill Bolton. And uh, later the F9 was developed, had a bit of air conditioning in that, making things a little bit cosy and comfortable for the pilots. They're a spoiled bunch, aren't they? Still are today, of course. F10 had a radar in it, and then we got to the T11, which is the one you see today with the uh, two-seat trainer version. when you're only doing it at 40 knots. <laughs> so here comes David's sister. Uh, delightful aircraft, as I say, I think most aviators have probably had a spin in a Tiger at some stage in their lives. And uh, pottering straight across now to the centre of the display area. Now this particular aircraft was built for the RAF in 1941 by Morris Mo Motors. Oh my word, he's gone into a tumble already. Well, that's that sporting stuff. Because I can assure you, neither the pilot nor this aircraft are any spring chickens whatsoever. And uh, that's very exciting. Good, well, that's a great entry from David's sister there, and I take my hat off to you, sir. But do you notice how with that sort of, not just the agility, and of course a biplane helps to give you that, uh, but the tightness and the speed, you can fly really, really tight manoeuvres in the Tiger Moth uh, without any stress whatsoever. You're barely pulling any G. And I was about to tell you, this was built by Morris Motors in 1941. And uh, he purchased this uh, particular aircraft in 1974 as a wreck and painstakingly restored and rebuilt it to its original condition. Now this was the most popular of all the Moth family and was designed principally as a training aircraft and very, very effective it was indeed. Many pre-war pilots learned to fly in Tigers, many making headlines of course in the pioneering days of long distance flying. And it was in 1978 that David was the first person to fly from UK to Australia in a Tiger Moth and this was a 10,000 mile voyage which took him 32 days. He cruised on average at just 60 knots and flew a minimum of 8 flying hours each day. Well, I must to say, if you don't know David's sister, I don't. I've not met him yet, but I'm enormously impressed with what he's doing with the Tiger Moth here. Really expertly flown, but then it's no surprise really, is it, for a former fighter pilot in the RAF. He was 22 years in the Royal Air Force when he flew the Nat, the Hunter, the Lightning, Phantoms, and Bulldog aircraft. Now, all of those iconic in their own way, and some of them very small con uh, cockpits indeed. Certainly the Nat is a bit like putting a shoe on. Uh, so he's well used, but uh, he got a bit more room in the Tiger Moth there. He retired from the RAF in 1989, and then he joined Logan Air on the Shorts 360 aircraft. 
that's currently based. Uh, I'm not sure whether he's still based in Edinburgh or not, and uh, was flying the Embraer 145 until recently. But he's been a veteran ent aircraft enthusiast for many years, as indeed is underscored really by his purchase of this uh, aircraft so many years ago. Now this is aerobatics at its most uh, gentle really, it's a lovely way to learn them and as I say uh, it's very very manoeuvrable, low speed, uh, low stalling speed as well which is always helpful of course when you're training to be a pilot and uh, David... Now whilst we're just waiting for them to run in and tell you a bit about, about these of course I mentioned uh, they're very much the Eastern Bloc competitors uh, with what we'll see afterwards which is the uh, pit special. But uh, they became available to Western Flyers in the early 1990s following the fall of the Berlin Wall. Now, a lot of them are ex-military machines, such as the Yak-52 two-seat trainer and the Yak-50, which is uh, the specialist aerobatic version. Uh, both have been used by the aerostars in the past. Any enemy-occupied countries such as Greece and Yugoslavia. Many of these hazardous special duties operations originally codenamed Operation Wild Horn, used long-range fuel tanks and landed into enemy-occupied Poland at night to deliver and collect important agents or senior Polish military officers. On one occasion, recovering vital components to a V-2 rocket captured by the Polish underground. Penetrating hundreds of miles of enemy territory with virtually no support, to find a small field lit by a handful of torches making a landing strip of marginal length for a Dakota. How courageous those men were, and how talented and professional. The pilot for the first Operation Wild Horn was Flight Lieutenant Dead Hat Ted Harrod, who successfully landed and then took off from a beetroot field nearly 800 miles inside enemy occupied territory at night. American version one. From the left, look at this unique formation the P 51 Mustang and the P 40 Kitty Hawk from that wonderful stable of aircraft at Hangar 11. Peter Teitman leading this formation expertly, uniquely, and I know he's having great fun. Very little choice for Peter in this one. I know his favourite aircraft is the Mustang, and I know he's loving every minute of this. <laughs> Daddy likes the Mustang. So. <laughs> P-51. Not surprisingly, uh, Peter involving the Kitty Hawk in a film already, but uh, over the years, Jumping Jack has appeared at many shows. Features heavily at the Flying Legends, of course, in Duxford, but with uh, such a fantastic, uh, gleaming, polished exterior, has become a favourite right across the circuit to all enthusiasts.
Because that would strike terror. You know that screaming there? That, that noise would be so familiar with the Germans, it would strike terror. <laughs> Well, we're not quite sure how much uh, Well, we think we're uh, coming to the closing stages of this sequence. We are not exactly in close contact at the moment, we're not quite uh, sure, but uh, this could be the last pass from Peter coming through. Now this one's going to take up a bit more room because its basic weight's 12,000 pounds, can go up to a max of 18,000 pounds, got a huge right 3350 18 cylinder radio giving 2,700 horsepower. Slower speed. Now, some of those French aircraft uh, actually moved on to Chad to fly to Libyan backed rebels, so very much in the action. Okay, we've just been chatting offline there to the pilot and uh, there's uh, no co great cause for concern. Uh, clearly he'll just uh, ease off the pressure of it and uh, he's going to give you a few more flybys and then he's going to return to base and get that problem checked out. So this particular aircraft was formerly a Korean War veteran, rebuilt by Douglas and sold to the French. Uh, then it uh, went into ownership of the fighter collection before being acquired by Kennett in 2004. It's wearing the colour scheme of an aircraft of uh, VA-176 when it was part of the USS Intrepid Air Group. Now I've got some details uh, from an actual pilot, a guy called Mike Stanton. Lovely topside view there. Ladies and gentlemen, look high, look left. Beware the honey in the sun. The mighty Spitfire is about to take the stage.
it may not have scored as many kills as the mighty hurricane did in those days, 1940, the long hot summer, but it was the most iconic, the most memorable aircraft to grace the skies during those years of the Second World War. Over 20,000 were manufactured, and to a certain extent it was great sadness that R.J. Mitchell never perhaps saw the might and the power of what he created in 1936. Because by the end of the Second World War, after virtually 24 variations and almost double the engine power, the Spitfire had come to dominate the skies. Only to be replaced, of course, by the introduction of the jet engine. The thin wing, the elliptical design, giving it the most efficient aerodynamic performance. But still with enough room for the undercarriage to fold and for the armaments to be fitted. Of course, in those early days with the 303 Brownings, you had to get seriously close. In fact, you had to see the whites of their eyes. Latterly replaced by the cannon with much more power, we're giving you the ability to stand off a bit further. But this particular aircraft is in itself unique, flown today by Anthony Hodgson, who's based in North Wales. This aircraft, Papa Tango 462, was originally built for the Royal Air Force in 1944 at the famous Castle Bromwich Works near Birmingham. Started out as a single-seat Mark 9, was delivered on the 21st of July 1944, and was immediately dispatched by sea to the Mediterranean Allied Air Force based in Italy. known to have served with 253 Squadron and is thought to have been used by 4 Squadron South African Air Force in the Mediterranean area as well. In 1947 it was transferred to the uh, newly emerging Italian Air Force and saw six years service with them before being acquired by the Israeli Air Force in 1952. And like many old warbirds was discovered lying near a kibbutz and luckily, somebody decided we wanted to fly again. And so many times this has happened in the history of warbirds that we see flying in England today. The partly buried fuselage, engine and propeller were removed in 1983 and taken to Falmere in Cambridge. And it was the late property developer Charles Church who bought the remains in 1984 and decided to rebuild this to fly condition, but he rebuilt it as a two-seat Spitfire trainer version, the TR-9. On completion in 1987, 462 made several display appearances, but following Charles's fatal crash, it was sold to an American collector based in Florida. But now it was picked up by Anthony Hodgson, the current owner, and stripped down and reshipped back to England and delivered to Duxford. And at Duxford, at the hands of the well known John Romain, the aircraft restoration company. 20 metre wingspan, sorry, 30 metre wingspan, but it's 20, virtually 20 metres long, and a maximum speed of about 196 miles an hour. Two big Pratt and Whitney R. 1830-92 engines. And those engines producing 1,200 horsepower each. Fantastic, really mighty. Very good. This, you really do need to watch. The Brightling Wing Waters are about to take, take the stage with their death-defying feats. They're courageous girls. We've leathered in lycra and about to entertain you vividly in this steep dive. Here they come. Welcome to the stage, the Brightling Wing Walkers. Today by 
by Dave Barrell and Martin Carrington. Huge amount of experience these two guys have got. Cover as much of the United Kingdom as they can during the course of an average summer. Please give them a big wave every time they come by. They're working really hard, those girls. Look at those things. Yes, they are real. They're not dummies, boys and girls. And they work hard for it. Huge competition to get up on the top of those wings. And they're really sporting girls too. Okay, here we go, coming back in the crowd centre now. Good opportunity for a uh, photograph on the split. Let's see if we can catch it. Exciting in the cockpit, so I know I would be with the girl on the top. Oops. Okay, now during the course of the routine, of course, the girls unstrap, they uh, put the legs up, they get the legs down. This time it's a leg up maneuver as they put the little bit of. Lovely colour scheme. Of course, two years where they were all pink and white. Uh, now they're bearing the name of the world famous aviation watch manufacturer, Breitling. All times keeping uh, in close contact with each other, uh, flying such close formation, of course, with uh, real life people on the wings is uh, not an easy activity. <laughs> Very much reminiscent of those barnstorming days when uh, pilots returning from the First World War, there were a lot of spare aircraft, not enough jobs around, so the guys just to fly into a local village and say, hey girls, come for a ride. Here we go with the uppity up, up, and the bumpity bump down. So as they're pushing down now, uh, all the blood, but look, they're upside down! Oh my word! So there's a bit of uh, reverse blood transfusion going on as the boys are pulling positive, the girls are pulling negative, and vice versa. And I wouldn't imagine they would know what <laughs> is the right way up. All based down at uh, Vic Norman's airfield, down at uh, Rencombe in Gloucestershire. Beautiful place to uh, fly in and out of. But uh, you'll see these uh, guys all around Europe. I think they've switched. They're lying on their side. Smoke is on. And going for the 360. Wonderful sound from those engines and propellers. There are 985 uh, Pratt & Whitney Wasp radials. Outstanding engines, 450 horsepower. And the propellers, when they're fully uh, fine, just about go supersonic. And that's the roar you can hear as they come past you. Still lying horizontal, still death-defying. Huge wind, you've got to bear in mind what those girls are putting up with. touch with each other, girls repositioning on the wings. Wonderful aircraft this, uh, the mainstay of the American training fleet uh, in the pre-war years, well rather the interwar years of course. And as I mentioned it uh, in those in the 20s and 30s, it would not have been an unusual sight at all to see a steerman land in your local farmer's field and just uh, shack up for the night and just to earn a few bob, they take the villagers flying. Here we are recreating, recreating that on a daily basis just for the sheer fun of it. Oh, and here we go. We've got 
go for the inverted. Now, look, I've seen them do this before. Let's just see. Yes, I think Martin's coming up underneath now to try and get the girls to shake hands. Keep your eyes peeled. Are they going to do it? Oh, look, they're getting so close. Oh, my God, yes. Yes, and they touch. Why don't you go tell me if you can see them touching? Because I can't see. I think they're nearly there. Oh, my word, that was just fantastic. <laughs> Well, if they didn't quite touch on that manoeuvre, we're all agreed here that was one of the closest they've been in some seasons, I can assure you. Now, if you've got any girls they want to have a go at this, I've uh, got Vic's number, I'll happily give it to you, but I'm not so sure. It takes a lot of courage and a lot of training. These are very, very fit young girls on the top of this wing. So here we come, another good photo op coming in. We'll listen out for the break. way for a change, that's pretty handy. Dave and Martin shouting out to each other, keeping a check, pulling in at the same time, and pulling round for another crossover. Calling, confirming this pass is going to be 300 feet. Girls still waving, boys and girls, oh, keep them away, won't you? They must be getting very cold and windswept up there. Still doing their exercises. Here we go, coming in now at 45 degree angle, both sides. Listen out once again, girls on their sides. Getting a bit lower now, 200 feet for the next pass. Keep your eyes peeled left and right. Keep a close eye on the girls. Here we are now, repositioning for an altogether different pass. Dave Burrell taking up the rear this time. Martin calling the shots. Where would the girls be this time?
think I heard Martin there just calling for the goose pass. Uh, now this is another interesting position. I'm not sure they get through all 69, but they certainly get through quite a few. Okay, now keep your eyes peeled, they've slowed right down. And I'm pretty sure the girls have repositioned themselves on the top of the wing for what they call the goose. they've actually unhinged themselves from the steel frame on the top of the wing. Now, if you thought the first bit was dangerous enough, I'd take my hat off to them. They don't, uh, they don't fail to uh, impress us, do they? Absolutely incredible, unhinged, unattached. And after that one, I'm pretty sure the girls will be climbing back into the cockpit for a well-deserved rest and hopefully to give you a very good fly pass. So if they're back in their seats on this pass, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, get your hats, get your umbrellas, get your paper aeroplanes, whatever you're holding, and give them a big, big wave because uh, they have been working enormously hard for you. They're coming in now, look, waggling wheels. Here's Martin in the lead. Yes, this is it. This is the final pass. Please come on, throw your hands, throw your hats in the air. Thank you. Well done. Outstanding, girls. Thank you, Dave. Outstanding flown. Oh, yes, a nice pass there. Food for the runner going in as he flies down the fly line. Fantastic stuff. Well done, the wing walkers. Thank you, Brightling, indeed, for supporting them, and uh, see you another time. Sydney camp stable as the Hawker Hurricane, isn't it? It's all within the space of a very short uh, few years, we move from a hurricane to a hunter. Amazing colour scheme here. Put on, developed and operated by Jonathan Whaley out of Kemble. This hunter was originally built for the Royal Air Force as a Mark IV back in 1956. And the first production batch of F4s initially delivered to number five maintenance unit down at Kemble. At uh, active service, it then joined number three fighter squadron at RAF Gelsenkirchen in Germany as part of the second tactical air force, and then was reallocated to number 229 operational conversion unit at RAF Chimna in Devon. Once his operational uh, life was over, it was transferred to the fleet air arm at Arbroath, uh, not too far away. Before being class surplus to requirements, they start for disposal. X 
Century Foxtrot 947 was uh, purchased by Hawker Sibley Aviation in 1971 as a Mark 9 for conversion to a Mark 58A as part of a contract for the Swiss Air Force. been operated by the Swiss until 1972. It spent many years with the uh, Swedish as a target uh, towing aircraft before finally being retired and sold into private ownership. With only 1,600 uh, total flying hours, Jonathan's company, Heritage Aviation Developments, acquired the aircraft in 1997 and placed it on the civil register as G-Pist, that's Papa Sierra Sierra Tango, and made a short ferry flight to Bournemouth for, Herit for a heritage uh, restoration by Jet Heritage Limited, which was completed in mid-1998. Jonathan's been operating. the most outstanding attention-grabbing colour scheme on the European display circuit, probably the world, even on the greyest of days. Sydney Cam Stable, of course, the designs uh, very much connected with the development of the Hawker Seahawk, a straight wing carrier based fighter. But looking to, do, uh, to get better performance and fulfill the Air Ministry's. Sydney Cam created what was then the Hawker P1052, essentially a Seahawk with a 35 degree swept wing. First flying in 1948 and uh, demonstrated the outstanding performance that was required. The time Cam took the opportunity uh, to introduce the Rolls-Royce Avon turbojet and the main advantage over the one that was in the Seahawk which was the lean was the axial compressor which resulted in a much smaller engine diameter and better thrust. Became famous, of course, as the uh, the stable aircraft of the Black Arrows, and uh, also getting the record of the number of aircraft to loop and perform in formation. And a beautiful sight, indeed. service with the Royal Air Force in July 1954 and the F2 pretty soon after that and it was uh, spotted that early on there was not enough uh, fuel capacity and uh, so additional work was done 
early uh, also compressor stalls were a significant issue, uh, particularly when the cannon were fired and often resulted in flame outs. to reduce the fuel flow when, uh, to the engine when the cannon were fired and that proved to be quite satisfactory. So it was only for a couple of seconds when the uh, guns were being fired the performance loss was uh, close to zero. The F2 produced uh, much at the same time had the uh, different engine, had the Armstrong Sidley Sapphire which didn't uh, suffer from these particular issues. first and there's a particular story about a flight of eight hunters who've been redirected to another airfield in 1956 not many of whom made it for a variety of I was talking about the range of the Hunter and uh, of course to address this problem it was fitted with modified wings which featured a bag type fuel tank and some wet hard points and this increased uh, the internal fuel capacity uh, significantly enough to... This resulted in the F4 which uh, first flew in 1954. Later developments increased the thrust on the Avon engine, bringing into the 200 series, and continued to be expanded and developed. The F9 saw frontline service right up until 1971, and alongside the. Uh, F-10 tactical reconnaissance variation based at the TWU at Broadie and then at Jim. The T-7 and T-8 remaining in use in the training capacity. Well, I think uh, Jonathan's just about wrapped it up there. He's uh, taken a little excursion into the, uh, into the cloud, but he's going to give us one more pass. So uh, just hold on to your hats for one more minute. Don't rush away as Jonathan gives us the final pass of the afternoon from Miss Navina. There he is. Thank you, Flapjack. Wow. Well, and we've seen some great arrivals this afternoon, but I think that was a hell of a way to depart an air show. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, the meteorology man, for allowing us to continue without a drop of rain. Thank you, the event organizers, Grant and all his staff, to the volunteers that have helped, to all the air cadets that have been here, the car park attendants, the police, the fire service, and everybody else. Thank you. Let's hope, let's hope we'll meet again next year. I've enjoyed it. I hope you have too. Thank you very much.